You're listening to Brand to Brand, The Marketing Show. With your host, Thomas Sterling. This is the future. This is where everything goes. And Veronica St. Cyr. Why the hell would anybody buy this? An unfiltered conversation on brand strategy. And it worked like crazy. Marketing trends. I think they're in again. And emerging technology. There's going to be big impacts here. You're excited. I'm pumped. (laughs) All right. Let's kick things off. Here we are, back in the studio during that lazy stretch between Thanksgiving and Christmas. When some people say, you can't get anything done, right? Everyone's already looking forward. They're into the new year. But a lot of people are thinking holiday shopping. Mm -hmm. And people are sharing stories with relatives, all sorts of things. I learned that bread used to be served in cans. Ew. I think it's the only appropriate B&M response. B&M bread. Have you ever heard of this? Like they just, Thanksgiving, they would have loaves of bread from a can. The best thing since <laughs> canned bread. So this is the time of giving thanks. It's a time of getting together with families. And in some ways, it's a time where brands are fighting for market share during this crazy holiday spending season when billions of dollars are being spent between Black Friday and I'm looking at you. I know you're getting nervous about your Christmas list. What's, what are your <laughs> thoughts on this, V? Uh, yeah, this is a big kind of brand showdown coming into the holidays and just thinking about the gifts that we used to give and receive 10 years ago look very different when it comes to brands of today. And in some past episodes of the show, we've talked about some heritage brands in particular that have reinvented themselves to stay relevant. And there's a way that you as a brand, if you if you are a heritage brand, you find a way to honor the past while preparing for the future. And a lot of brands do it right. And some fumble their way through Gen Z speak on TikTok. And it is very cringy. But today we're talking Talking about two of the success stories. And with that, let's get into it. It's a little bit of shake and then bake. Shake and bake. That's a big thing. Yeah, you can hear it. So, Stanley or LL Bean? What's it going to be, Veronica? I'm taking Stanley. I saw you You brought some power tools or, <laughs> or at least a, a tape. Yeah, funny <laughs> enough, there are a lot of people who believe that the Stanley Black & Decker <laughs> Tools brand is the same as the Stanley Cup Maker, which we are talking about the drinkware today, coolers, thermoses, and those big-ass cups you've seen all over the internet that seem to comically get bigger every <laughs> single year. Um, different brand, which, you know, the Stanley Black & Decker, the Stanley Tools website has something on their website that says oh, we are geez. not the drinkware <laughs> company. That's not the same. Um, but their brand, like even their their typography, it looks very similar. Yeah. So I feel like that could have led to some of the confusion. So we're here to talk about the Stanley Cups today, and that's what I'm taking. All right. Sounds good. I'm going to take L.L. Bean, tried, trusted, and true. All right. Well, L.L. Bean was started in 1912, originally launching with fishermen's shoes and expanding into all sorts of different categories, including home furnishings. L.L. Bean has been a beloved brand for a long time. And one of the things that they did to build customer loyalty was one of the most incredible customer loyalty programs. Mm. You could literally buy anything and return anything at any time for a new thing. (laughs) People were abusing the heck out of it. And they got in some hot water back in 2018 when they tried to roll that back. I I remember this at the time. I had friends who I won't name names, but were (laughs) abusing this. And you had people buying old L.L. Bean gear on eBay or at garage sales and just turning it in for store credit. I mean, they kept it going for a long time. And so there was a lot of abuse before someone looked at the balance sheet and said, wait a second, what the heck is going on here? We're losing millions of dollars. (laughs) How did that slip by? But L.L. Bean could be just another one of these brand stories that got lost in the seas of time. So thankfully, L.L. Bean in 2011 really leaned into digital and created a tremendously powerful e-commerce and mobile shopping experience. And in so many ways, that's why L.L. Bean has continued to have a tremendous following among customers. And they are a brand that leads with values. In fact, their mission statement has been to sell high quality products that inspire and enable people to enjoy the outdoors. Our commitment to customer service has earned us your trust and respect as has our guarantee, which ensures that we stand behind everything we sell. I wanna play a clip that just ties us all together. 
We have a long tradition in developing new ways of meeting our customers' needs. A critical part of our unique character is that of being an innovator in the systematic development of new and improved products, distribution methods, and customer services. There's a lot of confusion on the issue of innovation and who the innovators really are. It's a matter of definition to a great extent. It's also a matter of not confusing true innovation, which adds real value to products and services, with phony cosmetics and propaganda that add nothing to people's lives but hot air. And that was a member of LL Bean's team speaking at Maine's Development Foundation annual meeting back in 2019. They're such a huge part of what it means to be in Maine. They source and create a lot of their products there, and so they're a big, big part of that community. Well, a year after LL Bean is founded, the inventor, William Stanley, invents the all-steel vacuum bottle. This has become an iconic product. All steel vacuum bottles, Yeti's a good example, Clean Canteen, Hydro Flask, those are all following that model. When it first launched, I think a lot of people remember or maybe have like an uh, nostalgia for the Stanley thermoses. Mm. You picture like any guy on a job site whose wife packed him lunch and he breaks out his little soup and grilled cheese on the job site. So the cup, which we all know, it's the tumbler with the handle with the huge straw. It looks like an old big gulp. <laughs> it does. It looks like a big gulp just converted. Yes. In, it's like Yeti had a baby with 7-Eleven yeah. big gulp. That's that's what it looks like. Oh, I can't. It's an abomination. <laughs> oh my God. It is. Or it's a miracle baby, Thomas. It's Well, it's clearly um, the sales say it's a miracle baby. but So we're just going to call it the cup because they call it the Stanley cup. Not, not to, be, to confused. be confused. There's a lot of confusion <laughs> Stanley, around Stanley. <laughs> with the Stanley cup, which if you Google it, I'm sure they're going crazy with their SEM strategy to not just give you a bunch of hockey information. So the cup was originally marketed as an industrial blue collar tool uh, used for job sites. It, it was selling so poorly that they discontinued it. Then you have some influencers who come along and decide they're going to make this cup successful again. And how it took off using social media is a fantastic digital marketing success story. And you know, I brought a clip to help me tell it. Let's hear it. You know the Stanley Cup, and no, I'm not talking about hockey. I mean these big, giant tumblers you've probably seen in the hands of influencers all over social. Well, how they got there is actually pretty interesting. You see, Stanley is a camping supply company, and for a long time, they couldn't really find the right customer base for these cups. In fact, they sold so poorly, they were discontinued from Stanley's website in 2019. But the three women who run the Buy Guide website and social accounts found success selling the cups to women. And eventually they met with Stanley and created a partnership using influencers to sell the cups through affiliate marketing, AKA commission sales. It all worked so well. Sales of these cups are up 300% year over year and TikToks about these things have gotten billions of views. Absolutely crazy. <laughs> and it just shows you how people buy today. Yeah. People do not have any interest in watching an ad, but if somebody on TikTok, even somebody that they don't mm -hmm. actually know, even somebody that's misrepresenting and actually getting paid for their sponsorship of a product, it works. And we think about on the previous episode where we talked about Logan Paul's prime hydration and energy drink, it becomes this cultural icon where it's an ex the product's an accessory and people want to be seen with it. And you, you see them all over the place. Also, you have the rise of people trying to drink more water, doing water challenges. Mm -hmm. There's apps now to ensure people are consuming more water. You know, you even have people doing reviews where they're calling for, you know, I wish this bottle was a little bit smaller. That would be great. But it would be less iconic. There's almost a, a comedy to how large it is that it gets your attention. Someone even said, you know you've seen someone carry this tumbler into a meeting. Be prepared if you walk into a meeting with it. Someone is going to ask you about it. So if you don't want any questions about your water bottle, don't bring this to the meeting. That's the level of which people are paying attention to the sheer size of it. So why would they make a smaller one? And to this partnership, they've launched a whole host of other products. So we're used to seeing the Stanley Cup, and that's mainly what we're talking about today. But they also had, I saw this at a shop. I was at Beer Steins and all sorts of other interesting gear. Definitely still trying to dial it in. They've found an audience, and they've found sales, but it's still hard to connect the dots between your campground human that used to buy all your products and now your influencer yoga mat human. 
I don't see your influencers using those beer steins anytime soon, but time will tell. <laughs> and LL Bean, I mean, we, we, you know, I think LL Bean's been kind of existing in the periphery for a long time. It's a brand we all know and love, but we don't necessarily think about all the time. So how's LL Bean been doing? Well, honestly, over the last 50 years, LL Bean has had steady, continued growth. Most notably in 1996, they crossed the $1 billion threshold. And recently in 2022, they hit $1.8 billion. And when that happened, they actually gave all their employees a bonus of 13.5% of the annual salary. I'm sure that was a very happy day at LL Bean <laughs> HQ. So what has kept LL Bean moving and grooving during all these tumultuous times? One of the most recent campaigns that L.L. Bean did was their Be an Outsider campaign, which originally started before COVID, but was just so perfectly timed. The whole thought around the campaign was we spend 95% of our time indoors. 95% of our time indoors. Most of that's working at a desk. (laughs) But there's plenty of other times people are at home, sitting, at like sitting, watching TV, binging, doing whatever they're doing. So they're like, let's just try to take a few steps outside of the house. Be an outsider. And they promoted these pop-ups of people working outdoors, these kind of co-working settings. And obviously that played nicely during COVID, right? Because people couldn't congregate inside in an office. But really the thought was, why not promote working and getting outside of your physical space? I want to play a clip. L.L. Bean is kicking off the first ever outdoor co-working space. Yes, it's called Be an Outsider at Work. And everyone we talked to agreed it is the way to go. These folks aren't taking a break from work. They're taking calls, hosting board meetings, and even working out. This unique pop-up workspace is part of an experience called Be an Outsider at Work. That video had some great news coverage. Ultimately, they created these amazing outdoor installations where people could come together and work in the outdoors. With L.L. Bean. With L.L. Bean there (laughs) along the way, selling gear. So L.L. Bean's experienced some steady growth. They have remained popular. They've remained reliable as a brand. Stanley has done something with their newfound popularity, which has been to specifically market to women, which you do primarily see a lot of women influencers who are promoting their products on social media. However, the big thing on social media, which very recently happened, was did you see the video of the woman whose car caught on fire? (laughs) I mean, that's breaking news. Yeah, total breaking news. Um, This woman posted a video on social media where her car caught on fire and the ice in her Stanley Cup didn't melt, even though the entire interior of the vehicle did. And the CEO jumped on this viral moment to create some brand magic. And of course, we have to play the clip. You won't believe what happened in this video. Everybody's so concerned about if the Stanley spills. But what about the milk? It's in a fire yesterday. It still has ice in it. Yes, that Stanley Tumblr survived that car fire. And the internet is reacting. Like this user who said, Stanley better cut you a check after this advertisement. Another user said, I held off on buying a Stanley because I hate following trends, but this, this convinced me. Or others calling out Stanley to sponsor her. Well, they heard you because the president of Stanley, Terrence Riley, chimed in. Check it out. We're glad you're safe. I've seen a lot of comments that we should send you some Stanleys. Well, we're gonna send you some Stanleys. But there's one more thing. We've never done this before. And we'll probably never do it again, but we'd love to replace your vehicle. So my only comment there is how much ice did this woman have in that (laughs) Stanley for it to survive a fire? I want so much more of the background story (laughs) how this fire came to be. I want to launch a conspiracy theory into the internet zeitgeist, which is maybe they set the car on fire. (laughs) Stanley? People from Stanley did it? I was thinking maybe they paid her off to do it. I don't think they just showed up and, and torched the thing, but... Well, a girl can dream, Thomas, but this is reminding me, uh, and maybe it is for some folks listening, and we've talked about it on the show, which is when Ocean Spray Cranberry Juice capitalized on the smiling, skateboarding, singing Fleetwood Mac TikToker and gifted him a truck and, of course, a truckload of cranberry juice and product. But it was the same thing where a brand saw a viral moment and made this shift to lean into it, which is a is kind of like, if you think about it, was that in the marketing budget? 
Did they have truck money in the marketing budget? I'm sure they had to either blow their budget up or throw something else out of the plan, which just speaks to a lot of these brands. The way that they can continue to stay relevant is to stay agile in their strategy because you kind of got to leave room for improv. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. And honestly, the small dollars that they're going to spend on replacing this car versus the amount of social goodwill that they're creating. They took a viral moment, a viral flame, and they just poured gasoline on it. And now it is just going to go gangbusters for them. It's kind of like when Joe Rogan mentioned Yeti and how much Yeti coolers just do such a fabulous job. You can keep ice in there. So when you can get influencers and you can get pockets of people's attention and then you create social goodwill, it pays back in dividends. So similar to Stanley, which is this camp where working man, traditionally masculine brand has reinvented themselves to kind of switch their focus to target to women. L.L. Bean, a very outsider centric brand, has taken their first step down the catwalk into the world of high fashion with Anna Wintour, who is one of the biggest names in the high fashion designer in industry, being seen with an L.L. Bean bag. And she says it's her work bag that she uses to carry papers in. <laughs> it's not Louis Vuitton. It's not Gucci. It's L.L. Bean. It's been a summer style essential for Vogue. So it started to become an aesthetic product, just as some of the other heritage brands that we've talked about. It is a great gift. I mean, who doesn't need another toad? <laughs> so if we had to talk about any other brands on the show today... I'd talk about Birkenstocks. I don't know about you, but growing up, those things were super popular. Then they disappeared. You couldn't be caught dead with them. Now they're back and you can wear them with socks, which is just offensive and rude. <laughs> but that's okay. People love it. Birkenstocks goes all the way back to 1774. What? And what? Yeah. And now all of a sudden, they're once again a fashion staple, appearing to a broad demographic, including younger and fashion conscious consumers. I still don't get this one. I don't get it because I'm picturing one of the, like, when America received our independence, <laughs> someone was wearing Birkenstocks. That just sounds wrong. I can just picture the fluting <laughs> and someone comes over and their Birkenstocks are like, hey, man, <laughs> can you play that Jerry Jam? <laughs> A few other brands that continue to lean into tapping uh, younger markets, staying relevant, one of which we've also talked about as a, as a heritage brand that has found a way to market a lifestyle, Harley Davidson. Coca-Cola is one that's reinventing themselves. Mm -hmm. They just did a holiday AI promotion. Super cool. You should check that out. And lastly, Levi's. We talked about Levi jeans as reinventing themselves for a Gen Z audience. And they've, they've done that with leaning into influencers and trends and just kind of taking risks as a brand. And now for something completely different. So if we had to put this to work today, I would say first and foremost, lean into the lifestyle. We've talked about this before. We've talked about brands that leverage lifestyle. They win the hearts and minds of their audience. Second would be take credit of your history. A lot of brands miss the opportunity here. They miss the opportunity to dust off what made their brand great for generations ago to resonate with the generations of today. And this is not a history lesson, folks. We're not looking for archival photos, as exciting as they might be. It's about deeper connections and roots. The next is tell a better story. So find ways to leverage your story, leverage your product story, leverage your values, leverage your beliefs, and do that to create great marketing. And then the last piece is don't be afraid to launch new things. Sometimes that product that you might be just about to discontinue just hasn't hit the right set of eyeballs. You think Stanley's grow on trees? Well, they don't. There is no Stanley tree. So if you had to take anything away from the show today, Veronica... It would be... I would say if you're a heritage or older brand that is looking to reinvent themselves or maintain your market hold, it's probably a good idea to try to stay agile or adapt with the times, even if it makes you a little uncomfortable. Well, mine would be, if the internet hands you lemons, make lemonade. And with that, we're out, folks. Thanks for listening. If you liked what you heard, smash the subscribe button or listen wherever you get your podcasts. We're out of here.